Yeah. All right, three, two, one. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, our returning guest, a very special guest. His name is Jason Horsley. He has the website, Audiculture and Podcast. I was on his podcast a while back, but we've done four interviews discussing his books. The first uh, interview was Dark Oasis about John DeRuiter in Canada. Uh, the next was Prisoner of Infinity. And our most recent interview is Vice of Kings, which covered a lot of material uh, that I knew about, about Crowley. But tonight we're going to talk about a book that was published in 2015, January 30th, 2015, the title of which is Seen and Not Seen, Confessions of a Movie Autist. And the information in there covers Jason's interest in films. And we co he covers a lot of subjects from his perspective. So we're just going to talk about that. And Jason Horsley, are you there? Yeah, here I am, Bill. Thanks uh, for the invitation. Awesome. Thanks for returning. Appreciate it. It's always a worthwhile conversation. For those of you, uh, people who don't know kind of your background, maybe you could do a brief bio and then talk about how you became interested really in films and how it really, I know it started from an early age, but how this uh, book came about. Mm. Well, I came from a pretty dysfunctional family, uh, upper middle class and uh, a child of uh, youngest child of three, two siblings. And um, I grew up in a, a pretty decadent environment, I'd say. Like both of my parents were alcoholics and they weren't really very effective as parents. They, didn't, they weren't hands-on parents. Uh, latchkey parents is what they call now, or latchkey kids, whichever, you know. We were left to our own devices. And... Um, mm, I don't have very many memories from that early period, but uh, some of the earliest memories I do have, many of them really, are of watching movies. And um, certainly when I started writing, when I first started writing, which was pretty young, was around the age of 12, uh, I think the initial impetus, although maybe I had dabbled a little bit in, in fiction writing, I think I wrote a little bit of horror fiction around the same time, so I was drawn to writing from a young age anyway. But then when I discovered movies, when they became a passion rather, then my first writing was specifically ar around movies. And uh, that can, that sort of, that, that was also true as a published writer. Like my first published work was The Blood Poets at the age of 30 in 1999, even though by that time I had kind of diverged from a movie interest I thought and got much more into the occult, into shamanism, and into uh, alternate research, let's say, which I've also written a bunch of books about. But um, seen and not seen was kind of a, a way to bring those two interests together. And what it is is um, an attempt to understand my own past and my own psychology by looking at the way that I was shaped and informed by culture and specifically my childhood infatuation with movies that it did begin in childhood as I recount in the book, but it really bloomed in adolescence and, and then it, it took a sort of more concretized form uh, as I entered adulthood in that in the, I wanted to be a writer, a screenwriter, I wrote scripts, I wanted to be a filmmaker. So that was my initial orientation. So what Seen and Not Seen is mapping, essentially, this, the title is from a Talking Heads song called Seen and Not Seen, which is about the idea that it's about, it narrates the experience of this person who is not comfortable with their own identity or doesn't have a clear sense of identity and wants to imagine himself as somebody else. And so he focuses his will in order to reshape his features. So I, I took that song as a sort of, double leveled metaphor because I was into talking heads and so they did I model myself on David Byrne but also David Byrne is talking about that whole phenomenon of how adolescents uh, children adolescents and adults look for images examples in the culture as a way to shape their identity and to inform it let's say so so that's what I do with seen and not seen I like try and map what was going on there that was started very unconsciously and then became a little bit conscious. But even by the time I wrote the blood parts, I wasn't really conscious. Like I, I, 
I was writing a book of film criticism, really, but I was really revealing a lot about myself without knowing it. So seeing not seeing looks back over the years, the writing I did, but then also my memories growing up with movies. And but I think you successfully captured something in the book because your process of looking at these cultural influence through film is universal because so many other people, including myself, had their own times where they came in the influence of something and we're doing the same thing you were where this is somebody i wanted to emulate this is a hero this is a thing so i think that there's a real very kind of global aspect to your book where you can really extrapolate that to so many other people about how their influences really come from something that's fictional into reality so you see this kind of interplay through the book as well as that is is mm. uh, you know imagery and and things influencing the real world or real world opinion. So I commend you for that, for sure. Well, thanks. I mean, yeah, it is, uh, it certainly is a almost universal phenomenon in the West and it's somewhat acknowledged, even somewhat conscious, like uh, teenagers choose role models and they cover their walls with posters and they maybe do what I did, kind of look in the mirror and try and imagine that we're that person. And so it's all a more or less accepted part of rites of passage um but what isn't so accepted well two things come to my mind both of which i explore in the book one is what what kind of um, formative experiences in childhood compel us to seek out identification figures role models cultural uh, armor i would say you know ways to put on false personas in the first place because we don't when our parents aren't serving that function clearly so we're looking for these surrogate parents through the corporation media and then the second thing related is to what extent is this media being created deliberately by the by the corporations and the forces behind them the social engineering agencies and agendas consciously as a way to coerce generations into modes of belief values behaviors and so on and so forth right and so that overlaps with vice of kings this idea of social engineering all the vice of kings was much more specific to kind of a socialistic outlook but there's still the concern you're still getting these highly influential films you know yeah influential events but uh there's some somebody maybe to get started you could define who jonathan lethem is and why he was influential to you because I don't think many people have known that name. I certainly didn't. Right. Well, I didn't know who he was when I first heard of him, although I had um, I had one of his books without knowing it, which was the Philip K. Dick um, Exegesis. He was one of the two main editors of that book. So that was the first era of correspondence with Leatham, that he was a dickhead. <laughs> and you know, I, I've been quite big into Philip K. Dick, although I wouldn't say I'm officially a dickhead, but you know, he definitely was an influence. And but it was when I first found out that he was a Talking Heads fan and that he'd written a book about fear of music. Now that was my favorite album as an adolescent. It was given me my, by my brother, and it had a huge influence on my thinking. You know, the lyrics and just the whole sensibility somehow fit like a glove it's like cinderella going to the ball i got like this is the kind of cultural uh, artistic style that i can really relate to so i knew that Leatham must be a kindred spirit to some degree in terms of our pop cultural orientation um then the third thing was that he was uh, into superhero comics as a, as a kid not that that's unusual but as a writer and he wrote about that marvel heroes particularly so that was a really strong influence that i also wrote about and seen not seen fourth thing was that he kind of identified as autistic and i was trying on that identity too so the various ways in which i saw that he was a kindred spirit and that he himself had taken on similar cultural reference points to orientate himself to try and get a sense of who he was and that he had also, as a writer, writ, you know, explored that. Uh, he's mostly a fiction writer, a novelist, and I, that was partly why I probably hadn't heard of him, because I don't read much fiction. But he also wrote this book called The Disappointment Artist, which is a series of essays, similar in style to Seen and Not Seen, and it's very short. And I ordered that, and while I was reading it, it, it started sparking off all these thoughts and associations and insights. 
And so I began, oh, and, and also in the interim, I think even before I'd ordered it, I'd emailed Lisa via the college that he, he lectures at, teaches at. And he'd responded, I'd sent in the Philip K. Dick piece I wrote, which is about Philip K. Dick's autism, called How Am I Not Myself? And, and, and he'd responded very warmly. So I had this connection to him, a personal connection. So of course that increased my interest in him as a writer. I thought, okay, he's, he's open to actually, you know, he's got the human connection. So then I ordered the book. And then while I was reading the book, I began to have these insights and I began to write them down. And I sent they turned into an essay and I sent that essay to Leatham and, and then I felt I still hadn't, I was still discovering things while reading the book. So another essay and after two or three installments, I realized I had a book in the work. So that's how seen and not seen. That was the Genesis. And that's why Leatham became a central character in it because essentially he, he inspired it and it was written in, in a way, the whole thing was written as a dialogue with him because I kept sending him the chapters as it was proceeding. But as you know, certain chapters are actually about his work. And he he wrote uh, screenplays, correct? Didn't he have some screenplays that were made into movies? No, he hasn't had screen, screenplays. But he, I mean, he might have written some, but he hasn't had any pop, uh, filmed. But he, his, it's particularly Motherless Brooklyn of all his books, I think, that has been most option there was david cronenberg was interested okay. david lynch was r- rumored to be of interest but i just read lynch himself saying he never even heard about it um but it's now been made by edward norton so that particular book was picked up by hollywood and i mean Leatham was a, a minor literary celebrity uh for a period although not so much that you or i might have heard of him not like norman mailer and back in the day but uh, certainly he, he's he's enjoyed some degree of success uh, as a writer and of course that was very central to what I was experiencing while I was writing Seen Not Seen was the thing and I write about that too that here was somebody who I felt affinity with who had achieved the kind of success as a writer that I that had always been denied me so I was kind of hoping to 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 bridge that somehow by connecting to him uh, but also I was writing about that as as, as you know as a as a possibly neurotic kind of driving me to attain worldly success, you know, what's that really about and where does that come from? Right. And one of the interesting things that I saw that you really liked the movie that I love, which is where Eagles dare dare. And that was kind of your, uh, you know, that's Clint Eastwood was probably one of your first role models. And it's, it's a theme that goes through, uh, goes through the book. When, when did you see where eagles do very young it used to I, it was before the the streaming i saw it it used to play on like abc or cbs on the weekends but it was popular right. enough to uh replay a lot and i was actually for some strange reason was watching the end of where eagles dare where they confront the spy at the very end on the plane they give him a chance to jump out i don't want to realize should just... so isn't it on the ski lift is it or is it on the plane yeah on the plane right and they on get the, the guy and they say we know it's you it's uh richard burton and sitting with it's right there with eastwood but it's a great movie that's lesser known uh and it should be better known i think it's a great i just wonderful. got a, a book in the mail today about where he goes there it's just a little book also by somebody who was a big fan of it as a kid so it obviously has this kind of nostalgia this kind of whatever it's like it was a cultural landmark in some way but not as you say particularly critically it's not considered an important movie it came out in 1968 when i was one years old uh i remember as i write in the book seeing it at the cinema with my whole family uh when i must have been very young i wouldn't have been one but maybe it was a you know, a rerun or something, because I think they did that in England. Sometimes they'd show a movie that was just a few years old, they'd have it again. Uh, But I was so young, I don't remember. All I remember is the scene on the ski lift, and that when I saw it, they're fighting on the roof of the ski lift. And when I saw it again at 12, at this turning point, um, with my brother, I recognised the imagery on the the ski lift. So I'm like, wait, this is the... I remember seeing this in cinema, which, as I write, would make it the first movie I remember seeing at the cinema and the only movie I remember seeing at the cinema with my whole family because my father left when I was six. So, and then then I point out this weird synchronicity that the the title Where Eagles Dare spells W-E-D, which is WED. 
so whatever that means i mean who knows if there's really any if that's just a coincidence but the point is is that somehow that movie primed me for a lifelong passion for movies and this brings back to my previous point about why we seek an identity through pop culture that i lived in a dysfunction i grew up in a dysfunctional fra- family it was fragmented there wasn't unity there <clears throat> I just sorry go ahead i'm sorry and because of that um uh, so you just... a, a memory like that might actually be much more significant than it normally would. Like we were all together at that time. So that movie might actually unconsciously have unconscious associations with being together with my family now. And then I got these later memories of watching the first movie I remember on TV, Day of the Triffids with my mother and a friend. So that also has these associations of togetherness, of home, of comfort. And ever and to this day, I still watch TV movies with, with my wife. It's a place I go to to feel safe, to feel comfortable, to feel cozy, to feel like that, what I didn't have as a child. So that's very central to, to why we latch on to movies or whatever it is in pop culture as a way to feel secure, to shape an identity that makes us feel good about ourselves. It, it's inseparable, I think, from the circumstances and how traumatic or how fraught they were in which we were first introduced to that pop culture and and, and it provided an escape, but also a kind of added element within the fractious family life that made it better somehow. And that was kind of where Eagles Dare really is kind of the, the Eastwood mode where it's just, casually blowing people away. yeah That's all he does in that yeah. movie he barely yeah, he's got a body. submachine gun and just blows people away constantly right? yeah yeah i know but that wasn't consciously what i responded to i don't like i said in the book i think i write i didn't recognize eastwood for the first i mean i didn't couldn't tell who was who for the first half because i was young you know so i was like which one's which burton which one's clint eastwood I somehow i wanted to know and eventually i got it and when i got it i really got it and i was just by the end of that movie, I was like, I had to see everything Clint Eastwood had ever done. I became obsessed with him, in love with him, enamored. What? How, what? What is that? You know? How do? How does one account for it? I don't really know. I presume it had something to do with how powerful he was, you know, as a killer. But I don't have that conscious association. All I have is association with his face, his voice, his his coolness. Right? It wasn't so much his 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 toughness or his violence, but his how cool he was. But presumably they're also associated. Yeah, he has that same look on his face when he's blowing people. He never looks nervous. He's not sweating. Yeah. And I think that that's kind of a similar thing. Maybe he's grimacing, but yeah. uh, that's kind of the Eastwood model, I think, going on through. But that's a theme that goes through the book of your book is cinematic violence, the interesting elements of it, the satisfaction of watching cinematic violence, which is yeah. probably why violent movies are often very successful is people like watching the uh, violence that isn't fully real, whether it influences them in the real world, another open question, but. Uh, well, it's funny, I was just reading today, I was reading an Alan Moore interview because I'm writing about superhero violence now, that's so popular today. And he made, he, he got some flack for, depictions of rape and sexual violence in his writing and he made the point that yeah i do i do include that but it's part of reality and it's actually much more common than murder and yet in our culture we have constant image constant endless images of murder violence people being shot and blown up and nobody really questions it i mean there's a general sort of questioning about violence in the movies whatever but generally speaking nobody's saying you shouldn't depict murder on the screen the way they're now saying that you shouldn't depict rape and it's interesting now we're talking about seeing not seeing because of course i get into both these things in the book i get into how the appeal of clint eastwood style violence uh how strong it was for me you know how much i identified with it and why you know every, every sort of adolescent who feels insecure and in my case I was bullied by my older brother wants to be tough and cool and be able to handle the situation so there's a kind of an appeal of violence that is inseparable from that desperate need to have a safe sense of identity but I also write about how I got into violent rape imagery and I knew that that was wrong 
it never occurred to me that identifying with Clint Eastwood might be inappropriate, let's say, because I, I don't mean morally wrong when I say wrong. I mean, I don't, it doesn't have to be a moral question. It can be a psychological one, as in it's not healthy. Clearly, I knew it couldn't be healthy for me to be watching uh, imagery of women being raped and being turned on by that. I knew that something must be wrong with me and explore that in the book and why. But I didn't realize until decades later that there was also something wrong with me that led me to want to identify as Clint Eastwood in the first place. Well, it's interesting you bring that up because Clint Eastwood's role with women, if you look at his whole over, you know, all the work play Misty for me, these other ones, the women are dangerous. They're lethal. Right. And even and you talk about Sam Peckinpah as well. You mm -hmm. talk about straw dogs. Mm -hmm. Peckinpah had the same thing. If you watch the end of, uh, the end of the, the wild bunch, uh, hold Bill Holden. I can't remember his character's name, but he's betrayed by the woman in the the mirror. Remember, he gets shot by a woman. Shot that's by right. a woman, right? And that so you see these themes that are that are consistent, where the man is this very strong, or the male images, the male subjects are strong and steady, but the women are, you know, banshees. They're Jezebels. You know, so right. the depiction of straw dogs mm. probably has one of the most brutal rape scenes that people were freaked out about. I and mean, then you mentioned Pauline Kael's mentioned about that, which you can get into later, but there is a, there is a correlation between these directors. I mean, Clint Eastwood eventually would direct and the kind of woman as a, you know, yeah. a negative, negative aspect or a negative portion. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I don't get into specifics of what you're saying there in the book, but I do get into the correlation between uh, what it was about that violent imagery, violence against women that that excited me and my own psychological dysfunction in terms of growing up with a mother who was drunken, who was uh, half crazy some of the time, who was uh, verbally abusive, I don't want to put it too strongly, but she was scary. I was frightened of my mother growing up. Not the whole time. She was very loving as well. But that can make it even harder because I didn't know which face I was going to get, the Gorgon or the mother. You know? So anyway, so I had all this anxiety, tension, fear, rage about my mother from a, a pretty conscious age growing up and nowhere to direct it. And so logically it, it came out in this... Uh, the appeal of violence against women. Like if, if I had this repressed... Uh, anger against my mother it's like I would internalize this violence and I couldn't own it and then when I saw the images they somehow provided relief because I said oh that's actually how I feel didn't none of this was conscious um, but I, I do yeah I wonder now how much that correlates also with the desire to be a tough man uh, because if I didn't have a clear sense of masculine identity because I was all bound up with fear and love with my mother. I couldn't really develop my masculinity in a healthy way. My father wasn't even there. Then of course I identified with these, uh, these overly masculine figures who probably were also um, psychologically dysfunctional in their way for similar reasons. Hence Clint Eastwood, Peckinpah, whoever, they probably also have these mother issues, right? And that oh, Clint Eastwood clearly has issues with being like some interesting <laughs> Uh, issues with women. He mentioned Sandra Locke and all this. He has some very peculiar, uh, some very peculiar stuff has happened with him. So, yeah. um, but let's go back to like when you were when you were in your when you were in your youth. Like the uh, you used to watch the Hammer films. That we didn't really get that many of those in the U.S. Maybe mm -hmm. got a few, but you would travel to London from northern um, northern Yorkshire. England to go watch these movies back in the day before you know DVDs or wasn't wasn't Hammer I mean Hammer I was into because my brother was into them and, and they were on TV that was Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing these kind of movies so that was the British wave of horror and bloody full color horror that started in the late 50s so yeah that was something we kind of grew up with as, you know being part of our culture um by the time I was traveling up to London from Yorkshire to see movies, initially I would go to buy comic books. So there's a kind of 
clear transition there from the fascination with super, superhero comics to violent movies. Uh, you know, I carried on reading comics, and, and we can see that in the culture today. You know, the movie industry revolves around superhero movies, so there clearly is some sort of very close relationship between these two genres, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I specifically went up to see, try and see, you know, uh, revivals of Clint Eastwood movies I wouldn't be able to see on TV before the days of video, just at the start, and uh, horror movies. I remember going to see Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, in those days and yeah it was like a pilgrimage it was like you know the hero's journey and that was where you saw uh one of the more influential films for you which was track taxi driver correct that's right yeah i saw that i must have been about 14 and i saw that in a double bill with midnight express and i'd heard about it from my brother this would have been what in about the late 70s so early 80s so it hadn't it's only been out a few years actually at that point and i mean what what uh what about that film was so resonant with you um well i think it took time like that's one of those movies like many of the movies i write about and seen not seen or some of them anyway like particularly clint eastwood movies they don't really hold much interest for me now except in terms of understanding myself better Uh, Whereas Taxi Driver, insofar as I still have strong feelings about movies and and a kind of allegiance, let's say, to movies, uh, Taxi Driver is still up there, you know, in in my top movies. So I'd say that the older I got, the mature I got, the more I've understood, you know, why that movie is so important to so many people. Um, But when I first saw it, I'm not entirely sure, like, I certainly knew that it was ironic and that he wasn't an action hero. He was a lonely character who's suffering. Right. I think I did relate to it. I think what I write about uh, a little bit in Seen Not Seen, but more I've come more aware of it more recently, is, is that Travis Bickon Text Drive provided a, a sort of antidote for my Clint Eastwood identification because Travis Bickle, uh, I mean, you can imagine... If he went to movies, besides porno movies, which apparently he didn't, he would have gone to see Clint Eastwood movies and Charles Bronson movies, because that's the kind of guy he is. He's, he's like trying to be something that you might see on the movie screen that's heroic on the movie screen, but if you try and do that in real life, you're a psychopath. Right. Which is even true of the superheroes today. I mean, the superheroes are no better than the supervillains, really. They're using the same methods, right? It's just that they're state-sanctioned or whatever. They've got the right values, but their main value is violence to solve problems, right? Which is which is what psychopaths do in the real world, right? So, so with Travis, you saw that he wasn't really... He was using violence to try and solve emotional problems, but it was neurotic it wasn't it it was totally disproportionate to reality it was unrelated to reality so he was really just acting out his own demons and then the culture itself turned him into a hero because the culture is so distorted partly by movies but you could say that movies are more evidence of how distorted our culture is it's a bit of both right um that the movie showed this yeah that even a, a psychopath might get turned into a hero because our values have become so perverted and inverted. Really, he was a a lonely, alienated soul who just couldn't find a way to connect to women or even other men and was just full of rage and fear. And just so he just blew up one day. And and yeah, I, I related to that, again, without really fully understanding why. But I think it, balanced out my identification with Clint Eastwood because I also identify with Travis Bickle, right? But I didn't want to be Travis Bickle, you know? I didn't think I'm going to be a taxi driver when I grow up the way I thought I'm going to be a cop when I grow up. Right. I mean, I don't think that certain parts of him aren't heroic. I mean, he was trying to kill a politician, right? Before he goes and rescues... uh... Yeah, nothing's heroic. He doesn't rescue her. He he just kills a bunch of people and then she gets sent back to her parents, right? It's not really a rescue. No, it really isn't. So, yeah, it's not... uh, It doesn't really leave you at, like, this this, uh, 
what was the word you used in the book? This, you know, uh, it's, it doesn't get summed up all perfectly like most other films really like that. I think that's the first time in your book that you mentioned Pauline Kael. And that seems to be a, another influence. A lot of people may not know Pauline Kael very well, but can you talk about her? Yeah, I just um, published the two pieces from Seen Not Seen on Kale, uh, Cinephilia and Beyond. It's a website anyway. There's links at my blog. So wow. if people are interested, they read about Kale there. Uh, she, she's the film critic for The New Yorker in the 1960s, 70s and 80s. And she, um, mm, her, her reviews were published in a, in a bunch of books over the years. And I came across her books when I was about 14 or maybe even 13. So right at the beginning of my movie, Passion. And, and I stole them from the library, the ones I could find, and the whole library. And I read them, you know, I read all the movies that I'd seen and even probably ones I wanted to see. And she was, she liked violence in movies. I mean, she liked violent movies sometimes. She wasn't against violence at all. She loved Brian De Palma, for example, and Martin Scorsese. But she, um, she hated Clint Eastwood and she was very critical of the Dirty Harry films. So one of the reasons I include her in the book was she was also providing an antidote, if you will. She was giving me some a more nuanced awareness about the kind of toxic culture that I was imbibing, that enjoyable and in exciting and inspiring as it was, and I'm not gonna disown or you know, deny that. Like there is something about those movies, just like the comic books, that really does appeal to us in a very visceral way, and it's not all bad, but it's, it's basically a fantasy and it doesn't correspond with reality. Dirty Harry doesn't correspond with reality any more than, than Spider-Man does, you know? They're just, they're just fantasies and they're revenge fantasies to a large extent. Certainly Dirty Harry is, maybe not Spider-Man to the same degree, but still you've got this adolescent being bullied and then he gets to be a superhero and then maybe it doesn't take revenge, but there's a kind of, you know, now I'm a somebody thing. Right. Um, I think Kale was probably the most influential film critic of those eras, 60s to the 80s. Wouldn't you say so? I, I would say of any time. I mean, obviously, it's a short period of time. It's only 100 years. There are a couple of other critics like Philip Gee or who are maybe considered Manny Faber, who are considered, you know, great or what have you. But Pauline Kale was, I think, Influence is something you can kind of measure almost, and I'd say that she was definitely the most influential. And she certainly influenced me, I guess is my point. And she influenced me in, in, in more than just the way I'm saying it in terms of my view of movies, but she also influenced me in that the first book I published was dedicated to her, and it was written as an attempt to do what she did, literally. I just thought when I was in my late 20s, reading kale yet again i just thought this is so great i could do this though because i know enough about movies so i'm going to do what she did and i basically copied her i mean i didn't copy her but i used her as a model right and she reached out to you didn't she write a blurb for your book i had the blood poet sent to her when they came out and then with a letter i think i wrote to her personally and then she wrote back and it was a couple of years before she died so we had a brief correspondence and one telephone call and then, and then she died. But yeah, she did provide a blurb. So I, mean, I write about them, but it's like right. she, the kind of maternal figure who did actually, you know, give me a blessing. And she was kind of like, uh, she was a maternal figure, not just to you, but a lot of other up and coming critics, Roger Ebert, a lot of other people. Yeah. All, yeah. all that. And there was kind of a dispute um, about whether she was a positive influence or a negative influence on some of this. That's right. Yeah, there's a whole thing around that. And one thing I heard, after she, I mean, quite recently, even but one of those Paulettes, they wouldn't like being called that, but one of the people she helped with their career and who was kind of under her wing told me that she had said to them that she would have liked to have helped me more, but her health wasn't good by that point and she wasn't as connected, you know, hooked in at that time. So it's like I just dodged a bullet or I just missed a, a plane, whichever way you want to look at it, where, you know, it could have, my trajectory could have been different if I had the advantage of her support to get more established as a film writer 
I might have taken a somewhat different path, but I think it's for the best anyway that I didn't. And you also said you identify with Roman Polanski. That's kind of an interesting um, director to identify with. Why do you think that that was the case? I think what I said in the book was that, and this was an insight, of course, I only had much later, was that if, because I, I knew that there was something different about me and that, that included a predilection for dark stuff and even as I write about this, you know, very overt, conscious and indulged um, predilection for sexual violence, uh, that obviously weighed heavy on me, like what's going on there. Um, but I also felt that it was it was kind of inseparable from my you know, it's like sympathy for the damned. Like I was interested in serial killers. I was interested in understanding Travis Bickle and, you know, what drove people to violence, even as a young uh, guy. And um, so Polanski represented somebody who was a successful artist who also had these perverse aspects to his personality and had been embraced despite it. Right. So it was like, and even David Bowie in a different way. I mean, he, he was bisexual and he was obviously very weird and so on. Uh, he was, he was an early role model also was signaling to me, it's okay to be a freak. You can still be embraced by the world. So I think that was very, that was very important to me. But then I wanted to be a filmmaker so, and Polanski somehow when I discovered Polanski, I was, I was young, but I knew that he was, avant-garde kind of artist and that if i liked him which i genuinely did but that made me kind of edgy and more cultured right if i'd liked john wayne movies or clint eastman movies that was mainstream and populist but if i liked polanski that was like that meant i was an artist right i had an affinity for a very artistic type so i think there was a that was part of it i mean i did genuinely respond to his work but i also wanted to be more you know sophisticated so i picked polanski and i remember this might this probably interest you in the sort of larger subject matter that we both explore in terms of the, the the perversity of our culture and how it's become more and more visible i remember during that time i was about 14 i remember i used to think and i used to imagine in a speech i would say if somebody in an interview somebody asked me about polanski and how he'd been charged with rape of a minor, I would say, I couldn't care less if Polanski fucks sheep because of how great the movies he makes are. And this was the thought I had when I was about 14. Like I, I imagine myself saying that in an interview. That was my moral position, right? Uh -huh. It didn't matter. I think po Polanski was actually found guilty. He just skipped sentencing. So. Yeah, yeah, he was found guilty, right? And he, and he drugged this girl and she was 13. And really, I mean, it's, oh gosh, you know, it's pretty hard to justify what Polanski did and, and say, well, those were the times and all the rest of it. But people are doing that even today in the Me Too thing, right? Meryl Streep right. Uh, got some flack recently because right. she was... Well, actually, it was a long time ago, but she was applauding Polanski for the pianist, right? So it, Polanski generally is considered, you know, he's a Hollywood icon, even though he can't return to the U.S. Yeah, return. Well, his the story is still coming back. The 50th anniversary of the Tate murders is August 8th, so it's not that far away. Too. And it's in the movie, yeah, the Tarantino yeah. movie. And Dave, coming out. David Finch's Mindhunter also has Manson in it. So they're... And interesting, it was just a book, I don't know if you heard about it, about Manson and its mainstream publisher. Yeah. And it's about how Man uh, Manson was part of some... Uh, Would it be know. called Chaos? Yeah, that one. Yeah. yeah, I just interviewed that guy. You can look it up on my uh, channel or podcast. Oh. Name is Tom O'Neill. It's actually oh. really good. The good actual, the, the 10th chapter on mind control is an incredible piece of parapolitics because he actually dug around in Jolly and West's files at UCLA and found out that the MK Ultra people lied to the American people about everything and were able to successfully implant actions into a subject and then have that subject forget that he had been implanted. So they lied about that and he was actually taking directions and money from Gottlieb who was uh, the known adjutant 
uh, the head of the CIA was involved for MK Ultra. It's an Man incredible. Man Manson was. Well, oh, uh, I the, think really what West. it was. So there were two operations. One was the CIA operation of COINTELPRO, which was discovered by the Weathermen. But there was another CIA operation called Chaos, which was similar to COINTELPRO. It was a domestic operation. And the CIA isn't even allowed to use, you know, be involved, involved legally domestically. But it was an operation that got started by Johnson because he didn't want all this stuff. So there is a potential that some of these guys, including Manson, were um, part of this operation to discredit the whole peace and love movement. You know? right. Yeah, that was always my theory for the longest time. But what's surprising is, is it's, this book is a mainstream publisher, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I have it right here. Where is it? Mm. Well, kudos for getting him on. I, I emailed him, but I didn't hear back. So maybe I'll try again now. You try again. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so it's confusing. I mean, because the, the, the movies and the TV shows presumably are just keeping up the mainstream narrative that he's this, you know, loose cannon serial killer. But but it's becoming more and more mainstream, uh, you know, version is, is, is uh, allowing these other elements of uh, shadowy hands. Right. Well, I think the mainstream, the, this guy, uh, O'Neill, basically tries to, and I think successfully discredits the whole helter-skelter narrative. Mm, that, yes. uh, Manson really was some kind of nut because uh, the fact is, is that he was tied to that whole circle and there was something else going on. The title is Chaos, Charles Manson, CIA, and the Secret History of the 60s, Tom O'Neill, Little Brown and Company. So it's a legit. Yeah, it's a big company. Yeah, very big. But a uh, good book. Highly recommend it. But uh, yeah, so Polanski's still still relevant. I mean, this whole Polanski-Tate event. Um, well, and also, of course, the, not to get more sidetracked, but the uh, increased awareness in Hollywood and about Hollywood and, you know, the networks of abuse and the systemized abuse within it right yeah so that's becoming more and more known about so then well so that's the whole thing about this whole epstein is tied into hollywood you know there are yeah. definitely people who went to that island there's definitely pedophilia young girls and there's some other stuff going on at that island that i don't know if it'll ever make public but um and this is something that you might know but there were stops on epstein's plane to uh to tangier uh, to North Africa. So there's actually that potential that he was involved in some really shady stuff, things that you can only happen to uh, only get in North Africa, which you might know about. Well, no, actually, I'm glad to say I don't. Okay, good. Uh, well, well, that Jimmy, you... Jimmy Boyle moved there, I found out fairly recently. You know, my brother's right. ex lover, yeah. the yeah. gangster, he moved to Tangier some years back. It's probably a good idea. He can get away from any prying eyes. Um, one of the one of the interesting things in your book, other than Pauline Kale, you write a lot about Kale, but uh, there was some stuff in here that I, you know, a movie that I, you really like, Blue Velvet, as a as an influential film. Like yeah, that that was definitely the movie of all movies that most fully obsessed me when I was twenty when I saw it. And again, it's Frank Booth, the sympathy for the psycho. It's that whole thing. And like I identify with Frank Booth, and I felt sorry for him. And, so it was a way to develop compassion for myself. And I do think, you know, there is, despite all of the deep background, which I eventually get into a little bit and seen, not seen, of, of the pop culture of the movies and all the rest of it, that these things are ideological delivery devices and all the rest of it. Despite all that, it, it's only possible um, if the industry, so to speak, which I think is kind of an intelligence community slash industry, I'd say about Hollywood, really, uh, if it allows real artists to achieve success within it, because they need real artworks. Otherwise, the whole thing collapses, right? Right. And, and that would even include allowing these artists to make, you know, they have this thing about one for themselves, one for the studios. Well, maybe it's one for themselves and one for the intelligence community because the studios are really front. But, but whichever, uh, it's not just about keeping the artists happy. It's also about keeping the public 
believing in the dream factory, if all the dreams were obviously propaganda and ideologically you know, constructed and all the rest of it, they'd basically be crap movies as well. Right. You can't have both. So well, you can sort of have a bit of both. But, but if, you, if you have, you know, at least sometimes really good movies come out that might actually have a benevolent effect, um, then that keeps the whole thing seeming legit, right? So I'd say with something like Blue Velvet, that that David Lynch did do something genuinely uh, visionary with that work and that he was working out and exploring his own demons and I did respond to that. Now that doesn't mean that David Lynch didn't go on to do other stuff that was pernicious, I think he did. I think Wild at Heart is an example of the opposite kind of movie. Uh, and that's weird because they're back to back, you know, one followed the other. The Twin Peaks was in the middle. The Twin Peaks, I don't have any regard for either. But, right, so it's... Or Kubrick. I was surprised to see you weren't a Kubrick fan. fan. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I think that most people, that's just a standard, uh, kind of a standard set. If you are kind of an intellectual movie analyzer, I think Kubrick is there. Well, Kale hated oh, Kubrick. Okay. So that might have been part of it. I mean, she hated his movies. What for under what what uh, pretext? Why? That they were uh, pretentious. That they were they lacked humanity. They lacked emotional depth or resonance. They lacked originality. She 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 trashed two thousand and one as just a, a rip off, kind of totally unoriginal. When you read back her review of that film. Um, on a number of different points, many of which I would agree with, but he was a self-important artist, which I think is partly true. I think he was more than that too. But anyway, don't get me started on Kubrick. But I just never responded to Kubrick's movies. And Part with Orange, as I write about in the book, was a movie that I most wanted to see because it was banned in the UK and I knew it was violent and I knew it had rape in it. And it was banned in the UK, in my opinion, because it was effective and Kubrick was didn't want to be, get too close to it. The movie was about MK Ultra, but it was also by MK Ultra. Like it was, it was an instrument of MK Ultra. What film is that again? A Clockwork Orange. A Clockwork Orange. Gotcha. Right. I mean, based on the evidence and based on having seen it, it's a very manipulative movie, and it it, it caused copycat crimes in Britain, which is why Kubrick had it had it withdrawn. Um, right, so what anyway. was it, the Ludovic method or whatever. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, and, and and Anthony Burgess. Is, I write about this in in, scene, in Prisoner Infinity, not in Scene, not Scene. Anthony Burgess was a was a British intelligence agent, and Clockwork Orange was written in uh, collaboration with with British intelligence. I wasn't aware of that. No, I didn't know that. Unless it was American intelligence, I forget now because they. I didn't even know Burgess was an intel agent. But Burgess was an intel. It's in his official biography by Roger Lewis. And that portions of a clockwork orange are coded, were, were put in as code by intelligence. Wow, that's incredible! I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it wouldn't be the first one. I mean, you can see what uh, the Manchurian Candidate was totally suppressed for five or six years. The original one. Uh, the movie is pre- was suppressed for much longer. It was apparently it's Frank Sinatra who had it suppressed. Oh, really? I didn't know. That. After Kennedy was assassinated, which of course was a year after it came out. Right. Um, anyway. um, yeah. So. So where, yeah, where should we go from you here? Actually, yeah, where should we? Go? Let's talk about you going around and dropping off uh, business cards and and uh, your scripts at what Sam David Lynch's house, Brian De Palma. I sojourn in Hollywood. There isn't much exciting to report there. It's just a frustrated attempt. I had a uh, movie shaman on the cards, which probably didn't help. I was divided. I wanted to be shown, but I also wanted to be a successful film director. Uh, now I know that nobody in his right mind would want to be either one of those things. So, uh, but anyway, I, yeah, I, I just published Blood Perks. And so I thought I got to get to Hollywood and I've got to use this as a calling card. I get it to these directors, then they'll, they'll welcome my calls get it to Johnny Depp along with the script for Bring Me the Head of Sam Peckinpah and so on. I was very naive back then. I mean, I, I, I would never have guessed it because I was still paranoid. I mean, I was still aware that Hollywood had a dark side, but I was, I was naive 
really compared to what I now know, which is that, that, that I don't think there are good guys in positions of power in Hollywood. I don't think there really can be. I think you're right. I think you're right. I mean, I think uh, that, yeah, I, I haven't I don't see one. They're, they're just all being exposed as being terrible people. So, I mean, I think they've always been there. I can't imagine somebody would want to send their kid to Hollywood to try to make it. It's just uh, what you have to do is would be horrible. The compromises and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I still believe the myth back then, and this is also what I try and bust open for myself and seen and not seen. I believe the myth that talent, you know, rises to the surface that, uh, you know, if I followed my inspiration and I stay true to it, I would eventually attain recognition from the world. And of course, that that's the very thing that lures all these people into the Hollywood trap. You know, the obvious we're saying, you know, a starlet who goes there at 15 hoping to get their break and becomes a prostitute. Uh, that's that's just the lowest rung of that. You can imagine all kinds of variations at different levels and different ways in which a person becomes a prostitute. I'd say that my brother became, my brother was literally a, a male escort, uh, but he, I'd say he became a prostitute in other ways. In terms of, um, I suppose the idea of prostitute, which of course now political correctness, we can't use that as a, you know, a critical term, but Anyway, the idea of it uh, is, is that you, you sell something that is invaluable, but should never be assigned a value to it. So one's body, uh, one's sexuality, one's love, these things aren't for sale. I mean, one can literally sell one's body, even to science, but it's, there's no way to put a price tag on that. You, you demean yourself, you reduce yourself to an object. And... Um, this has got to be true also of creative inspiration and vision. What I um, didn't understand back then, because so few people do, and what seen not seen was my becoming conscious of, I kind of trace it in the book, was that that, that kind of creative vision that we have within us is that isn't there to create commodities out of and to create a currency to gain access to Hollywood or to worldly power. It can be used that way, but that's to exploit one's own soul, essentially, because it's really there to discover who we are and you know, and find our own meaning and purpose in life. And all of that gets tangled up with these cultural role models and all the rest of it. Like I saw David Byrne and Clint Eastwood, and I thought, those are my people. I want to be one of them. I want to get close to them. The only the way to do that is to be successful. This is how the people get tricked like i did a podcast recently about how kurt cobain was used by the cia to get hooked kids on on heroin you create a cultural figure make him a junkie uh, all the kids are going to want to be like him they'll do heroin well it's very simple it's almost like abc isn't it so in a similar way i was lured into an addiction to pop culture and to hollywood and to trying to be a somebody which uh you could say I squandered years of my time and my life force on that. You, know, you could also say, well, I wrote some books and I, you know, I learned a lot. Like, I, you know, it's a bit of both, really. I'd say that I definitely did like this trip to Hollywood. I mean, what was I doing there? Really, I was just chasing after a rainbow. It's, it's, it's almost like a literal version of that. If I can follow the rainbow, I'll find the pot of gold. But actually there is no rainbow on the ground and, and there's certainly no pot of gold. You know, the, the, the closer you get to it, the further away it seems. And you never even know when you reach the point where the rainbow is because it's invisible by the time you get there because it's, it's a rainbow, right? It doesn't actually have any tangible substance. And that's Hollywood, I'd say. It's a hologram. It's a kind of hologram. And this is uh, it's more what I'm writing about now, but the, you've got two levels of Hollywood deception. One is the movies themselves people consciously suspend disbelief, but more and more like the Hollywood, the Marvel superhero movies now, they're making us suspend our disbelief to such an extent that we're becoming totally dissociated and we're starting to believe things that no one in their right mind should believe, which is transhumanism, right? So you got that and then, and then you got the second level, which is 
the movie stars and the directors and the writers and the, all, all of that, the way that the industry is run and the lives of the rich and famous, that's all fabricated. Well, it's not all fabricated, but a lot of it is fabricated too. And we unconsciously suspend our disbelief by that. We actually believe that it's a democratic system. Right. That talented people just get discovered and they don't have to, there's no casting couch and there's no, uh, and so on. I mean, no selling out. There's no inside deals. There's no organized crime. There's no intelligence community, but it's the, op- I mean, I'm saying what there is actually, it's organized crime based. It's intelligence CIA based. I, mean, I don't know all this for fact. I don't know all of these. Well, some of those, some of those people are run by like their mob, their literal mob. I think Lou Wasserman was associated with mob. Sydney Corbuchard. Yeah. yeah. They're flat out mobsters. There's a whole bunch of flat yeah. out mobsters, and even the ones who aren't apparently act like it. Right. So exactly. Excellent. They may as well be, right? So, so yeah, it's it's a weird thing, isn't it? Because it's like when people watch a movie, they know it's not real, but they let themselves believe it. It's the same with Hollywood. People know it's not really the way they believe it right. is, but they they let themselves believe it. Right. And then you got something like Me Too, which is, or Kevin Spacey, or Harvey Weinstein, or whoever else is being trundled out as a, as a you know, fall guy. Right. That kind of uh, is a way to keep the lid on. I think you know, you got a little hole in the lid. Right. Well, because it's probably see- happening much in every single instance of these relationships. If you read Crazy Days and Nights, all that casting couch stuff and pedophilia, pedo wood. It's happening all the time, man. If it's endemic, yeah, then then the the idea of isolating a few incidents makes it seem like they are isolated and that they're for us. Yeah. I'm going to share you a picture that uh, was posted. There's like this uh, underground um, artist here in LA, and he does his artwork. But here's one that he did today. Can you see this? Yeah, once upon a time, Peter Polanski, Jeffrey Epstein, once upon a time in Petalwood. So they took the uh, billboard and modified it. So is that a photo of an actual billboard, or is yes. that just? Oh, it is. Yes. Oh, oh cool. Yeah. So that was just this morning, actually. Hmm, so where is that billboard? I don't know. I didn't see that part of the the ad, but mm. or the the article. Excuse me. All right, so I wonder how long it will stay up then, if that's an actual point. Yeah. I don't know. Mm. But yeah, Epstein's, Epstein goes deep in there. I think a lot of people be surprised to see how many people he knew. He actually uh, burrowed himself into a lot of parts of the U.S. culture, politics, entertainment, science, science mm. education. He's all over the place, so he's pretty successful. Yeah, well, there's no end to it. I mean, I haven't been looking into Epstein, and I may have to for this current book, but I'm actually trying to extricate myself little by little from this research because there is no end to it. And at what point, I have to ask myself, at what point is it enough to see the nature of our society and our culture to, to really turn away and start orientating myself more and more towards what is wholesome, what is life enhanced? Um, you know, because it has been useful. Like seeing not seeing maps, I would say it serves as a, a, it's not a handbook, obviously. I don't know what you'd call that. But what I attempt to do is demonstrate or enact or uh, show <laughs> my own uh, cultural deconditioning process. Right, right. excellent. Yeah, that's good so, so what I'm mapping there is what I'm saying I've been doing with all my books, but there it's more, it's sort of stripped more bare because I'm talking about my own particular areas of fascination, you know, that I grew up with. But the uh, looking over the different ways in which we've allowed our identities to be shaped by identifying with and um, valuing these cultural artifacts these cultural images and all the rest of it going back revisiting and looking at them and then sort of scratching the surface and seeing underneath you know what what's actually behind the mask what's underneath uh, that image that seems so shiny it's pictured of dorian gray isn't it imagine that this beautiful face and then you scratch it underneath is this hideous visage that 
that is a necessary, I think, process for, for cultural deconditioning, right? We've got to see the nature. These implants, we took them, we thought they were enhancing us, empowering us. Actually, they were infiltrating our system. Right. Into, it's like mind control. It's like remote mind control. So, so that's the process that's seen and not seen maps. And I think it has been helpful to people who've read it, who've contacted me that it's helped them. As you said, this is universal. So people can see not exact correspondences with the movies and, and actors, but they can find their own equivalent things and then apply that same lens and that, that same methodology to their own lives. They can also decondition. Right. right. So, I mean, we're at an hour, Jason. Is there anything else that you would like to add? I mean, that's a great summation right there. But yeah, you know, I was just going to actually, I was just going to wind up with uh, that. Hopefully that process does, end at a certain point or it becomes automatic like in the myths when the the heroine or the hero has to sort these seeds to find out the good ones from the bad there's too many to sort them all but she has to so she just starts even though it seems hopeless and then you know some insects come or whatever and they take over there's an intervention and by the time dawn comes it's all been done and so i'd say that in my own life what I began kind of consciously was seeing, not seeing the sourcing of the seeds of my own psyche to separate what was true to me and what was implanted by the false culture. Um, at a certain point, I feel I've got to just let it go. Something else takes over and it becomes automatic. We just naturally learn to identify in our own behavior and in the culture at large what's true and, and to filter out all the stuff that's toxic. So that that's the process that I've really been trying to uh, facilitate with my writing. Oh, cool. Well, it's a great book. I enjoyed reading it again. It's Seen and Not Seen, Confessions of a Movie Autist, published January 30th, 2015. Jason Horsley, thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. All right, so I'm going to pause.